Uh, again, welcome and thank you for joining this webinar during lunchtime today. Uh, my name is Annie Prasvetova. I'm uh, one of the consultants at the Information Lab and a part of the Data School. And I'm also a current uh, Tableau Data Dev Ambassador. And today we're going to look at how to connect to APIs using Altrix and how to extract foreign exchange rates in real time and bring them into your Altrix workflow. So first, we, uh, before we start digging into Altrix, we need to just to have a little bit of a refresher what APIs are all about. So if you have used them before, that's good. If you haven't, I will give you a little bit of an intro to this topic. So what is an API? Imagine you have uh, an application, client application, either on your laptop or your mobile phone, and you want to get maybe some information. So you are sending a request which can be get, so you're just getting the information. You can post even something, so you're contributing some data to the server you're connecting to. You can delete also some information from the server. That's uh, a little bit uh, outside of this webinar. Today, we're going to look at just how to get data from the server. So imagine you're sending this request. You want to get something from it. If this request goes by the API, that's the... Um, the the way to connect your application and the server and then api passes this request to the server that contains the data you want and then the server processes your request and sends the response that goes back via the api and into your application on your laptop or on your mobile phone the format that the response come in usually is uh, json or xml we will have a look at the different uh, formats in a second but the main idea here is when you're using your application again it can be say for example uh, a city mapper application uh, that allows you to navigate uh, around london for example to check what are the next uh, tube arriving or next buses so you don't even need to think about using APIs. You don't need to think about uh, whether I need to connect to server or how to get the data. You just use your app saying, I want to get from the point A to the point B. What's my best option? And so you send in this request to the server and get the response that shows you the best way to navigate from point A to point B. So you are using APIs basically in everyday uh, life uh, without even thinking about the complexity behind all of this. And the APIs can be uh, open source, they can be available for everyone, and we're going to look at one of these APIs in the session today. They can be also protected by passwords, or they can be also paid, so you can access, for example, um, you can send, for example, certain number of requests uh, within a certain, for example, time limit, or you can uh, send certain number of requests uh, for uh, an certain amount of money. So the APIs can be very different depending on the data you get in access to and uh, the complexity of the API. And uh, also uh, APIs can be um, uh, uh, open to everyone uh, and on the on the web, and uh, they can also uh, be uh, available uh, via specific apps. Say, for example, like I mentioned earlier, if you're using, for example, City Mapper, if you've heard about Amazon buttons as well, uh, you don't need to think about uh, work uh, workouts of uh, API. You just press the button to order a certain product, and that sends the request uh, to the server, uh, Amazon server, directly. So that can be very very uh, easily set up. And uh, also, um, uh, the last thing I want to mention here is uh, we are going to look at the REST API. So uh, these are so-called web service APIs, and they use the URL address to, uh, as a, the request is formed as a URL address, to send it to the server to uh, get the access to the information. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, when we work with APIs, we get a response in the format of a JSON or XML file and the uh, XML stands for extensible markup language and JSON stands for JavaScript object notation. And on the left side, on the right side, sorry, uh, you can see an example of a response from the API we're going to connect to tomorrow. And you can see that it's structured in a very uh, particular way. So every time you work with JSON, you're working with key and value pairs. So for example, here we have a base, that's our key. And in this case, it's a euro. 
the value for this key is euro. Then you can see we have the key date and the value of a certain uh, date. And then another key is rates. But then inside this key, we have a nested uh, structure with the actual currencies. So uh, they uh, behave here as keys. So for example, uh, pound sterling or euro or uh, American dollar. And then the actual uh, exchange rate is here as a value for each particular currency. So uh, this is uh, how a JSON response structures, and we are going to look at how to process it and uh, format it and clean it uh, using Altrix in a second. And the important thing here also when we talk about APIs is to understand how to read the response when you send the request to the API. So uh, first of all, uh, before giving you the data back, the server just uh, tries to validate your response and tries to uh, request and try to understand whether it's a valid request. And so you can get several responses sending your uh, request to the API. It can be 200, so that means success. So that's what we're looking for all the time. So then you can have a response uh, which is 301. Uh, that means that the re uh, API, the server that you're looking for, has been moved. So uh, you need to maybe change your request. Uh, then you can get a 404, quite frequently uh, seen error on the uh, on the internet. And here it means the same thing that uh, the um, URL you sent, it doesn't exist. So maybe you have an error in your URL. So you need to go and check back whether you structured your request properly. And then um, we have the 500 uh, error uh, response, rather, not an error, uh, that tells us that there is a problem on the server side. So you did everything right, you structured your URL correctly, but there is something wrong on the server side. So maybe it's down to uh, repeat your uh, request next time or maybe see when, uh, when the server is back up and running. And that's how you can understand whether your response is actually received, processed, and validated. And uh, just a quick overview how we connect to APIs with Altrix. So for this, we need just two tools, the download tool and JSON parse tool. And uh, there are several steps that we will take uh, in a second when we will look at the practical demo. So first, we will need to read the API's documentation and understand how to connect to it and how to format and structure our request. Then we will need to create this request URL. So basically just uh, write it out. Uh, step number three is actually sending the request to the API uh, using the download tool. And then uh, breaking the key and value pairs in the response that comes in the JSON format uh, using JSON parse tool. And then the last step, step number five, we need to clean the response data, maybe reformat it so it looks nice and uh, structured and we can use it further in our workflow. So usually step number five, when we're working with APIs and Altrix takes the longest uh, because um, it's usually quite straightforward to connect to APIs and download the data, but then formatting it and bringing it to the format we need, to the shape we need, that's usually the most uh, time consuming part. So uh, now we understand a little bit about the APIs. We understand how they work. Uh, we understand also how to connect to them in Altrix. So let's now go into Altrix and see how we can connect to this API, the foreign exchange rates API, and extract foreign exchange rates uh, directly into our workflow. Uh, forgot to mention at the beginning that uh, feel free to you can feel free to uh, put your questions in Q and A or chat, and we will pick them up uh, at the end of the session. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them later after the demo. So let's go into Altrix. Let me just uh, zoom out to show you the overall workflow. So you can see it has several branches, and we will see why it has different parts. But otherwise, this is the overall workflow we're going to look at today. And also notice that I have uh, documented this workflow so you can understand which, what each part of this workflow is doing, including the comments as well next to each of these parts. And I will provide the link at the end of the session again uh, to uh, where you can download this workflow and use it uh, on, your, on your site um, in, your, in your workflows. So uh, the very first thing that uh, we need to do when we are connecting to APIs in Altrix, we need, as you remember, design our um, URL. And for that, we're going to use the tool that's called a text input. Let me 
zoom in a little bit more. So text input, and you can see that uh, structure of our text input is very simple. We just need to create the column that's called URL, and then we need to put our URL that we're going to use. That's our request URL. Before we go into details of how to structure this URL, as you remember, the first step we need to do is to look at the actual documentation for our API to understand how we need to structure our URL. Let me put it on the side so you can see it maybe better. So I'm here looking all at the website for the foreign exchange rates API. And there we can find the um, uh, documentation for this URL to understand how to structure our request. So if I scroll a little bit further, you can see that we have the documentation is quite straightforward for this API. And that's why I also chose it for this example. It's uh, easier to understand uh, a straightforward API when you start working with them, just to understand how they work in general. And then you can move on to more complex examples. So you can see that uh, the documentation gives us just some examples of how we can structure our URLs. Let me just make a little bit bigger to get different types of response. So for example, the very first one, we can just send the request to get the most recent uh, exchange rates. So most recent will be for yesterday because today uh, still is, is in process. So uh, if you want to get the latest uh, rates for yesterday, for January 11th, that's the type of the URL. That's how you need to structure your URL. So it's just the URL, the address of the API, and then slash latest. Uh, you can also uh, look at historical rates for a particular day in past. So that's an example of uh, this one. So here we need to include our URL and then the actual date that we want to get exchange rates for. And then uh, we can also change the base for the base uh, currency for our request. So for example, here we see that the rates for this particular API by default are quoted against Euro. So if we want to quote our rates against, for example, uh, American dollar, you can see we get this example uh, in the lower box here uh, that we need to give again the URL of our API, then uh, slash latest, and then uh, next, every next, um, any, any new um, uh, parameters that we want to add to our URL, we just need to put after the this question mark. So you can see we have here latest question mark, and then base is the parameter we want to set here. And in our case, we want to set it to be a USD. So it says equals USD. And so uh, that's how we can read the documentation for this particular API, for example. Obviously, this is quite a short documentation. So you see, it's just one page. But uh, some APIs might have very, very complex one, uh, a lot of pages of documentation. So let's start with the simplest example. Let's look at the getting the latest foreign exchange rates. So this is our URL that we need to use. So that's just a URL for the API and then slash latest. So if I go back to my Altrix, you can see that that's exactly what I'm inputting in this URL in my text to um, text input tool. So I just bring the text input tool and add uh, the URL with a slash latest. So that will bring me my latest uh, currency rates. So once I bring the text, um, the text input and add my URL, next I need to bring the download tool. And it can be set up in a very easy manner. So on the left side, you can see the configuration pane for my download tool. And I need to make sure that I'm pointing this download tool to the field where I have my URL, the re request URL. So in my case, the field is called URL. So that's quite straightforward. You can see that there is this drop down that where you can select the field if you have more fields in your input. In my case, it's just one uh, URL. So I just need to make sure that I select that. And uh, let me just run the workflow to connect to my uh, to get my uh, request URL, process it through the download tool. Let me make a little bit wider. And then if I click on the output anchor of my download tool, 
you can see that I'm getting some uh, response back. So first, I'm actually downloading the data from the API. So you can see I have this download data column. If I uh, just double click on this uh, cell to see what I'm getting, you can see that that's our JSON um, uh, that's our JSON uh, response. It's uh, a little bit difficult to read. It's not as structured as we saw in the picture earlier. We will deal with it in a second. And then we also get in this uh, column that's called download headers. And you can see that uh, we're getting the response 200 and saying, OK. So that's where you can check whether you structured your URL request correctly and whether you, uh, your request has been validated and processed correctly by the API. So for example, if I go back to my text input and say, uh, instead of latest, I say remove the last T. So my URL request won't be processed correctly now. So if I press run again, just to show you that you, you will get a different response. So for example, if we'll click on the output anchor of our uh, download tool, you can see that now we're getting 400 and it says bad request. So my request wasn't validated because my URL wasn't actually correct. The API didn't understand what it means latest. So I need to go back and just fix the typo I created. So uh, let me run this with the correct URL now. So that's the first step. We are processing our request via the download tool, download our data, and get the message saying that we are fine. We connected to the API with no problems. Next, we are bringing the JSON parse tool. That's another great tool on my canvas, just after the download tool. And again, the configuration for this tool is quite straightforward. You can see on the left side, you just need to point this tool uh, to the field that you want to parse. There you have JSON and you want to parse this JSON with this tool. So um, if I see what's coming in to my JSON parse tool, I know that I want to parse the download data for column. So in this drop down, you can see on the left side, I need to make sure that I selected the download data column in this configuration pane. Now, uh, when I run this workflow, well, I, I ran it, I already have the result from the JSON parse tool. So if I click on the output anchor of my JSON parse tool, you can see that now I have download data coming like that. But once I process it via the uh, JSON parse tool, I will get instead of my download data field, I will get my val key value uh, and key and value pairs split into individual rows. So you can see now I'm getting um, JSON name and uh, JSON value string as two separate columns. And each uh, uh, currency is on individual row. So you can see that we because we didn't specify which currency we want to get as a response, we are getting all the available currency here in this list. And then I'm getting the exchange rate for these currencies. And if I scroll to the very bottom, you can see how my response is structured. I'm getting at the very bottom just two last rows. I'm getting the base currency. I haven't changed it, so it's still euro. And I'm getting the date for which I'm uh, receiving this uh, exchange rates, which is the latest. So it's yesterday, it's January 11. Uh, 2021. So that's how we can uh, see that our JSON is parsed and it's looking much uh, clearer to understand. So now we can spend some time on uh, brushing up this data and actually uh, turn it into a table that we can use further into our workflow. And uh, to do that, we will see um, we will see uh, why I'm using this filter in a second. But because we are um, Get it. We can uh, send different types of requests. We can send like we did now uh, to get just the latest exchange rates or maybe exchange rates for one particular date in, in the past. Uh, that will come formatted in one way. If we're going to send a request to get exchange rates for a certain period in time for several days, that will come formatted in a different way. And we will see the difference and how we can change and process this data um, in uh, accordingly. So that's why I am using these two different branches. So this one, the uh, box, uh, the 
container I'm looking at now at the top. This one is uh, working with data that got uh, that we extracted by sending either the latest request or the request for a particular date. So my filter tool here is set up in a way that uh, it looks at the URL that we sent. So you can see. So let me click on it again. It looks at the URL that we sent just a basic tool and checks a uh, basic filter tool and it just checks whether my URL contained the word history. So if you want to get uh, exchange rates for a certain period, you need to add history in your URL. We will see in a second how to do it and how different the response will be. So if I have, if I don't have history in my URL, like we didn't, we just have the latest. You can see in the in the preview at the bottom of the screen. So that will take the data further into this upper branch. And we are going to look at how to clean it up and prepare for uh, to, to use further in our workflow. So uh, that's my true output of my filter. Indeed, just the same data we saw in the after the JSON parse tool. So as I said, at the very bottom, you can see that um, that we have these two rows that actually gives us um, the base rate we're not that uh, interested in here. We know that it's Euro, but it gives us the date for which we got our exchange rate. So to extract this date and create it as a separate column, I'm using the formula tool here and creating the field date. And uh, in, this in this formula, I'm just saying, check the JSON name field. So that's our field here that we just got recently. And if the JSON name has the value date, then uh, in this new uh, column that we created, that's called date, just uh, take the value from the JSON value string column. So you can see that's going to be our exact date that we're getting exchange rates for. So after we process, after we apply this formula to the to our table, we are just uh, basically moving this day, extracting this date from the JSON value string and adding it into its own column so we can use it. So uh, we now extracted the date. Now uh, we just uh, need to uh, resort our, our table based on the date field, this new date field. Uh, and we need to sort it by this new field date and sorted by in descending order. So we, I'm doing it here for the reason that I want to apply the multi-row formula next. And uh, I want to have the date at the very top as the first row. So I am able to fill all my uh, cells with nulls with this date so I can uh, um, use it further in the workflow. So when I sort my table based on the date field in descending order, you see that my output is now uh, exactly the same table, just sorted that my, so my date uh, is at the top. So now I'm able to apply the multi-row formula. So that's how I'm getting my table into the multi-row formula. You see, I have the date field and just date at the top with null values further. But then my multi-row formula, I'm saying to update this date field. Uh, and then I am creating this expression, the formula here that says, if my, go and check the date field, and if the row by row, and if uh, the cell in the date field is null, it has a null value, then um, uh, put the uh, value from the row above it. So basically, if you look at our column field date here, uh, column uh, date here, we can see that if the row has null value, it just goes up the row um, above it and just takes the value from it and puts it in the cell. If the uh, cell is not null, then it just keeps the same date value in it. So that's uh, how we structured this um, um, this conditional statement here. So now when I run this uh, multi-row formula, you can see that the date column is filled now with exactly the same date, but that's correct for our purposes because it the, all these currency exchange rates, they are for just one uh, date, 11th of January. So you can see that now we have this column filled very nicely and we're ready to move on to the next step.
So now we do not need this, um, this two um, last rows in our data. Um, let me click before into filter. So we don't need this last rows with our base, um, base currency and the date. We don't need we don't need this field. So I'm just bringing the filter tool here and saying only give me the only keep the rows that in the JSON name field have the, the word rates. So only actually keep the rows with our rates in them. I don't need uh, this um, field, uh, this row that has the date because I already extracted it into a separate column. And I don't need this row base because I know that I'm uh, uh, getting the exchange rates against the euro as uh, you using the euro as the base currency. So uh, once I in in the false output of this filter, you can see that uh, we're getting exactly these two uh, rows. We can just forget about them now. And then in my true output, I'm just getting only my currency exchange rates. Uh, and now I will just use the, um, the text to column field to split my JSON name column that's, uh, that has the value rate dot and then the symbol for the currency. I will split it into two new columns, uh, rates and then the currency. So I'm using the dot as delimiter here and I'm splitting into two columns. And then I'm just using the select tool to get rid of all the uh, columns I don't need, such as URL, download headers, uh, JSON name, I don't need it anymore. Um, and then uh, JSON name one, I don't need it either. But I just want to uh, rename the JSON value string to be a uh, rate and also change the data type of this uh, column to be a float instead of it being uh, a string. So originally, uh, this field is a string value. I'm turning it into float, into a number. And I'm also keeping the, let me make it a little bit wider. I'm also keeping the um, JSON name to column. So that's the one with our currency symbols. And I am uh, renaming it to be currency. So that's just a little bit clearer for us. And that's the table that's coming into the select tool. And that's the output from the select tool. You see, we just have currency rate and then the actual date for this rate. So now we have this nice clean data. We can uh, table, we can uh, use it further. We can maybe change the shape if we need it, but uh, that's, uh, that's the final output. We can get exactly the same result. So if I go back to my starting point, to my um, text input, we can get exactly the same result, not for the latest rates, but for example, for um, some date in the past. So for example, I will remove the latest in my URL and just type uh, 20, um, 2020 011. Uh, uh, so uh, for the same date, but a year ago. So in 2020, 11th of January, uh, 2020. Just before I run, let's check that the format of our date is correct. So uh, here I just saved it as an example so we can refer to it. Yeah, we have the year, hyphen, month, and then hyphen and the date. So that should work. Let's run our workflow again. And we didn't have any errors, which is always good. So let's click on the uh, output of our select tool, the very last one in this branch. And we can see that we're getting exactly the same format of the table, exactly the same response, but just for the date a year ago, the same date. Uh, most likely 11th of January was uh, on the weekend. So we're getting the previous, the most recent, um, the latest rate before this date. So 11th of January maybe was a Saturday. So we're getting the exchange rate from the 10th of January from Friday before this Saturday. So that's how you can um, send a request and get dates for just one particular date. But as I mentioned, we also can get um, can send requests and get data for a historical period. So for example, if I want to, uh, I have this, um, this uh, URL here as well saved. So if we want to get our uh, rates uh, for, um, let 
Let's split it like this so it's easy to see. If we want to get our rates for a particular period in time, so we can, uh, instead of latest or the actual date as we saw in the previous example, we need to put history after the slash, after our uh, API URL. Then question mark that sets, uh, that stands for here, I will start adding all the new parameters for this request. And these are my parameters. So I'm saying I want to get the dates for the period that starts on the 30, uh, 1st of October 2020. So again, you see the date should be formatted uh, for this particular API in this way. So start underscore at equals and then my date. Then to add a new parameter to, um, to this uh, request, I need to put this ampersand so, uh, sign to say and. So the, my period starts at the 1st of October and it ends on the 31st of October 2020. And I want to bring only two currencies here. I want to bring pounds and dollars. I will still keep the euro as my base currency, but instead of getting all these uh, currencies back, I want to bring only these two currencies instead here. So that's how we can request um, a currency, uh, sorry, um, exchange rates for this particular uh, period in the past. So let me just paste this um, URL in our text input instead. And we are going now. So before we were looking at this upper branch of this workflow, now we're going to move to the lower branch because now, as you notice, we have history in our URL. So that will tell our filter after the download tool, after the JSON parse tool, that uh, this, uh, since this URL contains the word history, that will put it into the lower branch. And because we will see that the date is structured in a little bit different way, so it should be uh, formatted afterwards in a different way. So uh, let's get back to our text uh, input. So you can see that I inputted this new uh, request, this new URL. So let me run this workflow again. And now uh, you can see that in my true output of the filter, I'm not getting anything because my uh, URL is now looking at the historical period. So uh, let's now see how does the data come in the, this, for this particular request. So if I'm looking at the false output of my filter, I'm getting all my historical rates. And you can see that it's structured, the data coming in for this request is structured in a little bit different way. So if we look at the JSON name column here, we can see that it has uh, rates as we had in the previous example, but then it has the date embedded in this uh, value as well. So it's rates dot the date for which we're getting the exchange rate dot and the uh, relevant currency. So here you see we're getting uh, American dollars and pounds uh, interchangeably for the same date because we want to look at two currencies at the same time. And then uh, similar to the previous um, output that didn't change, we're getting the values of the, the actual rates in the JSON value string column. And if I scroll to the very bottom of this response, you can see that again, instead of um, and as in our previous example, just getting one date and then the base. Here we're getting the start at the end end uh, dates and then the base, uh, similar to the previous example. So here we are getting the date in the JSON name value itself, but also as separate two separate rows. So let's see how we can format and how we can work with this data. So this is going to be lower branch of our, our workflow. Then uh, you see that uh, because we have the date embedded already in the values, in each of the values in JSON name uh, column, I actually don't need these rows at all. I don't need to extract this data like we did in the previous branch in the uh, when we were working with just one date. So I'm just filtering out this uh, three rows at the bottom. So I'm keeping only the rows that have rates in the um, in the values so all the actual rates so that's what my filter tool is doing here 
Uh, once I'm, uh, you see, once I'm applying this filter, my F output has these three rows and then uh, which we don't need anymore. And the true output has all my rows with rates. So that's fine. Now we are using the same tool as we did before the text to column to split our JSON name uh, column again by using the dot as delimiter, but this time we're going to split it into three columns because we want to extract the date and then the currency. So that's what we are getting here on the right. We have JSON name one with our rates work, which we don't need, we will remove it. Uh, JSON name two, our date, and then name three is our currency. So that's, um, that's nice, we split at this value. Then we're using the select tool just to clean up our table. And uh, instead of having all these different columns, we're going to have just three, the rate, the date, and the currency. So you can see in the configuration, I'm uh, changing names of some of these columns. And also I'm changing um, data types for some of these columns, like uh, our rates are going to be float uh, numbers and the dates are going to be uh, date format. So that's uh, first, that's our table ready. But uh, imagine if you have, for example, um, um, if you have uh, a, a table with sales and you sell uh, from online shop and you sell um, on different dates, you sell on work dates, you sell on weekdays. And as I mentioned, the currency uh, exchange rates, they are available only for work days. So you will have some sales, for example, that happened on a weekday, but you won't have the correct um, currency exchange rate. Because for example, if we uh, look at here, we maybe won't be able to find it immediately um, from just looking at the table, but we might not have the date for say a Saturday in October when you made the sale and from and compare and connect it to the correct exchange rate immediately from this list because we just don't have it. So what we want to have, we want to uh, have the table with all the dates. So in our case, it's going to be in October, 2020. We want to have the table with all the dates from the 1st to 31st of uh, October, and then to fill in the missing currency rates, uh, currency exchange rates uh, for this uh, weekend dates just taking the last Friday before the weekend and filling in the, the cells. So let's see how we can how we can do that. So once we have a little bit smaller table, easier to work with, now we're going to bring the cross tab tool and see how we're going to set it up. So uh, we are going to uh, take to group our data by uh, our table by the date field, because um, we just want to have for the same date, we want to have uh, one column uh, with the, our currency and then uh, rates, but not repeating the date. So we want to have one date repeated just once. So we want to group our date table by the date field. And then our column headers are going to come from the currency field. So instead of having a currency field, we're going to have one column for USD and another column for GBP. So that's how uh, we're going to structure our table. And then the rates, the exchange rates val values are going to be filled in into corresponding column. So uh, that's what we have now. If you look at our results pane, that's our table at the moment. And if I click on the output anchor of my cross tab, you can see how the table changed. So now we have the date column still like we had, but we have each date repeated just once, just one row for each date. And then we have one column for pounds and another for USD. So that's, uh, that's uh, how we changed it. So if you look at the coming in table, we have 44 records, 44 individual rows. The coming out table has 22. So we removed, let's say, so duplicates from our date column, and we just uh, have one date repeated once. So that's uh, our table ready to be uh, processed further with the tool that's called uh, TS Filler. So uh, this tool, TS Filler, is available from the time series um, tools category. So you need to make sure that you have the predictive tools installed uh, in your Altrix to be able to have access to this and use it. But um, 
instead of using the TS filler for analyzing time series as it was intended originally, you can also use it for these situations when you want to actually uh, create additional, uh, create let's call it scaffolding for the month. So in our case, it's October. So we want to have all the dates uh, filled in. So now uh, if we look at our date column, we have one, two, first, second of October, then we clearly have some weekend happening between the 2nd and the 5th of October. So we're missing the 3rd of October and the 4th of October. And so we will find all other dates that are missing here if we go further and look at our date column like that. So the TS filler tool here is very useful because if you point, if you bring it into your uh, workflow, you point it to the date column that you are going to, uh, that you want to update. So in my case, it's just date fill. And then I'm saying, uh, I'm choosing the interval that I'm going to use to uh, create my scaffolding. So in my case, I have the date level. So I'm saying the interval here is date and the increment is one. So I want to get every day in this uh, in the sequence from the 1st of October to the 31st. Uh, you can also choose uh, other uh, increments here, depending on your data set. It can be minute, hour, week, month, or year. And then you can also set different increments here. So in my case, it's day and just one day at a time. So when I apply the TS filler, when I click on the output anchor of this tool, look at the new column that we create, well, even two new columns that we created. So date is our uh, new column. And then uh, the TS filler takes our original date field and renames it saying original date time field. So you can see that we indeed are missing the 3rd and 4th October, for example. That's uh, what we didn't have in our data. And uh, it creates these new rows for these missing dates. So we can then uh, take care of them and fill them in as we feel needed. So you can see that uh, now in the pounds and dollars uh, columns, we have these rows with null values because we didn't have any values there. So we will need to fill them in. So uh, that's a really good tool to create this kind of scaffolding and uh, understand, um, to, to see all the dates that are missing and uh, fill them in, understand how you can fill them in um, based on your use case. And also the new also generated column here, flag generated row is just telling you uh, whether this row has been added by the tool or whether it was from the original data source. So true means that this field has been added, this row, sorry, has been added by the TS filler. So uh, that's a good step. We don't need to go manually and check all these dates. So now I'm just using the select tool again, just to brush up the table to remove all the columns that I don't need and get back to my structures I had it before, date, uh, pounds and USD. But we still have this nulls here the value, null values uh, in the missing days. So we're now going to fill them. And uh, that's how we're going to do it. It's a little bit um, of manipulation here as well with data. So first, we, we can't just uh, um, we can't just fill them in uh, directly using the multi-row formula. We can, but uh, that might be uh, a little bit uh, difficult here. But uh, the, a good way around it uh, is to add a record, a unique record to each of these rows. So you can see I'm using the record ID tool and I'm just generating a unique record for each of the rows so I can then uh, match them up back. Then I'm using the uh, transpose tool to change the shape of my data. So instead of having uh, pounds and USD as individual columns, I'm turning them into uh, uh, into one column. So that's going to be called name. So I'm grouping. I'm, I'm using keeping my record ID, sorry, and the date field as they are. But then my data columns are now instead of having two columns, pounds and dollars, I'm turning it into one column name. And then the values are coming from this pounds and GBP and USD columns that we had before. So just to show you again, that's how we had the data before the um, transpose tool. And that's how we're going to have it after we apply the transpose tool. Then we're going to add a column number 
so using the uh, multi-row formula. So I'm creating a new field that's called column number. And notice that I'm grouping my records, my rows by record ID. So if we look at the output, we see that the column number is going to be, you see that we're grouping by the record ID. So it's one and one. And then uh, the column number is just the sequence one and two. And then it restarts when we get to the next record ID. So you can see when we get to number two, to uh, record ID two, it goes the same way, one, two, and then it restarts from the next one. So that's the calculation I use. So um, if my uh, previous uh, row in the column number is null, so that's correct because I don't have anything there, then put one. Uh, otherwise, just a uh, column number plus one. And so that's why it goes one, two, and then restarts from the, from the next uh, record ID. So that's uh, giving us the groupings for each individual day. So you can see that uh, our column number is uh, um, grouping by the day. So it, it's counting in each day. So uh, next one, we are going to sort our um, name and record, uh, our table, sorry, by name and record ID. So you can see that's our original table and that's how it's sorted after the sort tool. So we just uh, basically get in the table with uh, all the exchange rates for pound in this case by uh, date. Uh, so we are sorting by the record and the name, the currency in our case of so pound in our case. And then I can apply the multi-row formula to fill in my values. So that's my data coming into multi-row formula. Let me just make it a little bit bigger here. And I am updating my value column, the existing column I already have. And notice also that I'm grouping by my uh, name field, which is my currency field with the GBP. And I'm just saying that um, uh, if my value in the, um, if my uh, cell in the value field is now, then take the value from the row above. If it's not now, then keep the value as it is. So very similar to how we did it for the uh, previous branch for the latest rates or for the rates for one day only. So that's how my table now looks like. So you remember that we were missing number three, um, October 3rd and October 4th. So that was a weekend. So now we are filling this uh, two days with the value of the rate from the Friday, just before that, from the 2nd of October. So that's my table field. And now I just want to uh, make sure that it's all uh, sorted, just uh, to be on the safe side. I bring another sort tool and sort my table by the record ID and column number. So again, I just have all the uh, records um, uh, in, in correct order and all the uh, based on the current uh, column number as well. So they grouped correctly. You can see that I have for one day each uh, currency and their corresponding rates. And then I'm just uh, using the select tool to brush up the table and uh, remove the, um, the, the columns I don't need. And I just rename the name column to be my currency and value to be my rate column. So I'm getting exactly the same uh, format of the table as we got in the previous branch, but here we're getting more rates because we have more days and in this case, two currencies. We can add as many currencies as we want in the original, um, I go back, in the original um, URL. We can even skip the symbols part and get all the currencies that are available for this particular period. So you see, if I remove this, uh, my symbols parameter and just run this workflow, I will get a very long table at the end. Let me go back to the end. I will get the very long table at the end with all the currencies that are available for all the days in this period. So I'm getting 960 records here. So you see, we can add one currency, we can add, uh, remove the parameter and just have all the currencies. It doesn't really matter. So I uh, just want to quickly show you before we finish, if I bring my symbols 
parameter back and just bring for one uh, currency, say for example, for pounds. Um, say for example, uh, and I just run this workflow now. Say for example, we have um, sales in our, um, let me open this. I have a dummy field here. So I have uh, European sales uh, coming from uh, different departments uh, of our shop uh, located in Europe. So they are bringing the, the sales figures in Euro. So that's just to give you um, in an overview of this uh, data. So I have this data and I want to convert all these uh, sales values into pounds directly in my workflow. So that's my big uh, workflow connecting to API and getting all the, um, all the currencies, all the uh, responses. Then I'm just, um, let me just send it back so you can see the tool. Um, I'm using the, for some reason it doesn't want to show it. Let me just remove this. Um, I'm using the union tool to bring together both branches of my uh, workflow. So whichever request you will send, you will get at the end the same exact table. You will get currency, rate, and date. So you can see that, uh, just to show you uh, in the manual uh, option, that uh, both of the outputs are exactly the same from either one day uh, rates or for the historical period. So that's why you can run uh, any of these uh, queries and at the end you'll get exactly the same table. And then I'm just joining this output with my historical rates to my um, uh, mock-up sales data based on the date. So for each of the dates, I'm uh, matching the value and the, the rate for this currency. So I know that I'm running against the euro as my base currency, and I want to convert all the sales into uh, pounds. So you can see that after I join these two tables in the join in the J output, um, I'm getting the same exact table plus I'm getting the column with the exchange rate. And then I'm getting the I'm bringing the formula tool just to convert my uh, order value in euros to order value in pounds. So that's my uh, final table. Um, that's how you can use this um, this uh, connection to APIs to further connect convert the currencies in your workflow. So that was um, everything. Uh, quite a quite a uh, di diverging um, uh, workflow. So I do appreciate that if you, you might have some questions. So um, just to give you uh, a little bit uh, of further resources that you can look at the, um, this workflow, it's available to download uh, and the link will be sent uh, uh, in, uh, in the chat as well. So uh, that's the, the workflow and you can download it afterwards from the information lab. Um, Oops, sorry, from the Information Lab um, uh, Altrix Gallery. Uh, you can also uh, look up uh, some different public APIs that you can learn, um, a look at and learn how to use APIs in Altrix. You can also do some challenges from API, uh, Altrix communities on APIs. And also we have some blogs on Date School blog and some videos as well on the Information Lab's YouTube channel on how to connect and work with APIs in Altrix. So while I'll post the link to my workflow in the chat, uh, I will um, um, have some time for questions. So feel free to ask any questions you have. That's great, thank you. Um, hi everyone, it's Steph here. I'm just here to uh, uh, ask any questions that have come in. Um, so we do have one um, in the chat. Um, in your example, the 31st of October wasn't in the list. Um, how would you go about bringing that in? So if that last day is at a weekend, the time series didn't um, fill in that um, last date. Let me see. Um, 
That's a very good question. I guess I would maybe go back and uh, change the end date then to be uh, the 1st of uh, November. That might be a solution. So now if I run it, that should bring me the... Uh, I think um, another solution, so there's think probably it's... a few different ways that you could do it. Um, one way that you could generate those rows or bring those weekend dates without, if you don't have access to the mm -hmm. time series tools, um, there's a tool called Generate Rows. Um, so you can yeah. probably use that to fill in fill in some gaps. So what you would be able to do is have a condition where you, you feed in that start and end date in. Um, yeah. And fill in, fill in all the gaps. So that's that's another option. Um, yeah, I imagine the first is probably a weekend. Yeah, maybe also weekend. So here yeah. we go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so yeah. there's probably a few different solutions. Depends on on what your what you want your output to be. But um, yeah, the generate rows would give you the same output as that kind of time series tool. Um, can't remember the exact TS filler. Um, yeah, but it was, would be a bit of a more of a manual kind of yeah configuration. Right? Yeah. Oh, and um, one other question as well. Um, so if someone if if we're trying to use this um, this is kind of in your sales example, um, what if you have users who don't have access to Alteryx but want to be able to call that API and maybe change the dates or something like that yeah so um you can um convert this uh, workflow into turn it into an app an alteryx app so you can use the uh, tools from the interface um category and uh, you can just turn it into app and upload it onto the alteryx server so people who don't even in your company who don't even have access to alteryx they can go directly on the um, alteryx gallery on the alteryx gallery on the server just put the conditions they want to the request they want to get they don't even need to think about the url you can uh, set your app in the way that they just need to select the currencies they want to get the period they want to get this uh, rate for and just press run and that will generate say for example a csv file so they can use it um, as they need it further great and um, that's all the questions we have at the moment so unless we have any others we just give people a minute or two um what we will do is put um all the resource links in the description of the video once it's up on our youtube channel um so if you take a look there if you want to kind of go to any more of those links, the weekly challenges um, that have been recommended. Um, other than that, that's that's all the questions. So other than that, all there is to say is thank you again for joining us. Um, check out our meetup page for more webinars and things like that. Um, and um, our YouTube channel um, for lots of resources on there as well. Um, yeah, other than that, thank you everyone and uh, enjoy your afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.